a lot of trust is built in that first email, even though it is the shortest one you're going to write. And so in that first email, just to kind of expand on it, I would put my, a picture of myself, a link to the lead magnet that I offered. I would orientate them. So reminding them how they got there, particularly for those that do a lot of newsletter builders, anthologies, or partner partnering opportunities where there may be a lot of authors involved and they're like, I don't remember doing this. Hey, remember you, you read that anthology, you signed up for this newsletter. This is me, you know, and here's your, here's your free book that I promised you. And then I set the tone for what's going to come. Yeah. You know, so I'll be in your inbox over the next seven days, three more times or 10 days, however long you want to put in between. And we're going to get to know each other really well. And that whole thing is written in your voice, you know, so it's just this consistent feel for like every time they pick up a piece of written content from you um, and your emails can do that so much faster than the social media. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 243 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Holly Darling. Holly Darling is a self-published author and an email marketing consultant for authors based in the theater city of Stratford, Ontario, which is not all that far from where I am in Waterloo, Ontario. Over the years, she has helped nearly a thousand entrepreneurs grow their businesses with proven email marketing strategies, and it all began with her passion for writing. Holly's mission is to teach writers how to use emails to increase their sales and cultivate loyal fan bases. Her signature course, and there'll be a link to that in the show notes here, uh, Email Marketing for Authors, is for writers looking to use email to grow their business. And there are free courses available on her website. So whether you're a brand new author or an experienced writer looking to cut through the noise, Holly's passion is to help authors turn their readers into raving fans. And I have a fantastic interview with Holly coming up later in this episode. It was broadcast live to my YouTube channel as well as to the Stark Publishing page over on Facebook. And we mostly cover, we do cover email in general, but the importance of a nurturing email welcome sequence. And this is a phenomenal conversation. I took so many notes. And as I was just going back and editing the audio, I took even more notes. And I know you're going to love it. And it's coming up later in this episode. But first, a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. What is Findaway Voices, you might ask? Well, I'm going to tell you. That was a giveaway, wasn't it? But what is Findaway Voices? Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you to get your audiobook out into the global market. If you're looking for a narrator, they have two ways of finding narrators. One of them is through a process that uses kind of a project manager internally at Findaway Voices. You fill out a form and say what you're looking for, and then they go and find within their network of narrators between five and ten narrators that they think would fit the project. They go from varying price ranges as well. Or if you're more of a DIY kind of person, you can use Findaway Marketplace, which was launched this year in 2022. And you can go and search and filter and find different narrators that you would like to potentially audition to see if you want to use them. Findaway Voices has options for you to do payment splitting and payment sharing with narrators. So there is a Voices Share program. There's some narrators are willing to do and some narrators aren't. But the way that that works is you pay the narrator 50% of what you would normally pay them, what their normal hourly pay is for audiobooks, and then they get a portion of your royalties. If you 
are really, really, really DIY, and you already have the audiobook because you already have a relationship with a narrator, etc., and if it's good to go and professionally produced, you can use Findaway Voices to upload that directly. And when you go to distribute, you can choose where you want Findaway Voices to distribute to. The power, the control is in your hands. They have found a way to give you the most flexibility, the most freedom, the most options, and the most choice when you're looking at creation and distribution of audiobooks. So if you're looking for the foremost worldwide platform that makes it so easy, so efficient, so convenient for authors, look no further than Findaway Voices, and you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. The sponsor of the podcast supports this show's hosting fees over on Libsyn, which is where I do my podcast hosting, but my patrons support my time in producing this weekly podcast. And I want to welcome to the fold, Holger Nils Paul. Holger, welcome to the family of 36 patrons who support this patron over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. Welcome aboard. Thanks for listening. So a special thank you to Holger, as well as all of the patrons who support the podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. I said that already. My God, you should really not repeat yourself, Mark. <laughs> oh, well, when you don't go off a script, right? <laughs> but um, speaking of patrons, uh, patrons get access to additional content. And I also just recorded another reflective round table. So I said once I hit $100 a month, I would do a hangout with patrons, just patrons only hangout. And uh, if they're okay with it, I will record it and I will play it for all listeners. Just another way that the patrons kind of support the entire listenership, not just myself. Uh, but this last weekend, just recorded a reflective round table. Uh, like I said, as a patron only hangout, we talk and we share about our own reflections on usually one or two particular topics. Well, this past weekend, Roland Denzel and Maddie Dalrymple, thank you, my patrons, joined me and we talked a lot about print, uh, print on demand, POD, dis distribution, supply chain, author copies, in-person events, bookstores, libraries, and it was a lot of fun. We had a really, really grand time. I've recorded that and I've got their permission. That'll be coming up in a future episode. And brief update, uh, this is more of a teaser. So Faye White who was in the February Reflective Roundtable, was talking about going to her very first in-person writing workshop. And via Patreon, Faye recently messaged me to share with me an update about her experience, because we talked about that and she promised she would do that. So she shared that experience about attending her first in-person writing workshop earlier this month, March of 2022. So I will be sharing Faye's update and the recent chat that Roland and Maddie and I had in episode 244, the next episode in this series, which will be a special extra between Fridays episode of the podcast. And so a special thank you to all of my awesome patrons and welcome Holger for joining the team. In terms of a brief personal update, I am going to a bit of a sort of a, a writing retreat. I've got some work that I've got to get done. I've got to be some heads down. So I'm going to be going uh, away for that. So I'm recording this on Monday uh, this week, and normally I do all this recording, etc. on Thursday. So I'm going to sort of skip the brief personal update, but I did want to say, and it's sort of related to, wow, look at how many patrons I have, look at how many listeners I have. We cracked 100,000 uh, downloads several weeks ago, and I completely, I keep forgetting to mention it. So I want to say a special shout out to all of you awesome listeners because I couldn't have gotten to over a hundred thousand downloads without you and I really appreciate you being here and uh, listening I'll return to my personal update and comments in uh, the next uh, not the next episode but in the the next next episode which will be episode 245 but for now let's be done with this introductory matter why don't we get into this interview with Holly Darling? Now, as I mentioned, this was broadcast live less than a week ago. Uh, I am uh, I'm recording this on Monday, March 28th, and and it was just sort of a live because I wanted to give people a chance to uh, ask questions, etc. We did have some viewers uh, live, um, some commenters, etc. But 
There were no questions that came in, so it was just basically a conversation with Holly and I. So what you're going to get is a slightly edited version of that video. There'll be a link to that video if you want to see it, um, because there's some graphics, etc. But there will be links, of course, in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca, as well as a special coupon code that Holly is offering for anyone who wants to take any of her paid courses. Uh, she does have a free course that she mentions, and there will also be a link to that. But without further ado, why don't we get to this interview with Holly Darling. This is a Stark Reflections live broadcast, which will be going to the podcast feed. And I am I'm honored to have with me in the virtual studio tonight, Holly Darling. Holly, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks, Mark, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So the topic at hand is going to be email marketing sequences, and, and I want to get into that. But first, before we go there, I want to get into your background as a writer and how that kind of led into this. So you are a romance author? I am um, a contemporary romance writer. I have um, one pen name that's published and one that is super secret. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and it's only super secret because it really is all over the place. But um, I have, yeah, eight books out there in the past five or six years. Uh, and I love writing books, but um, I also found a natural affinity to writing emails or as, as an extension of, of my voice and of, um, you know, who I am and what I wanted my readers to know about me and about the books. Uh, and it's, it's something we can get into later. I'm always, um, whenever I talk to authors about email marketing, one of the biggest things is like, oh, I'm not interesting or, or I don't have anything to say. And I'm like, we're writers. Like, this is what we do. I mean, we can write our, our extensions of our stories in email. So I found that uh, I gravitated to email as a marketing method uh, and enjoyed it. And I'm a big fan of doing what you, you know, marketing where it feels a little easier, you know, and yeah, right. so this is, you know, a, a, career, a new career was born, you know, that I, <laughs> I really so you've it. been writing for how many years now? I've been writing um, self-published for about six years. Okay. And then when did you love, get into loving the email marketing uh, aspect side of things? Um, I think I've had my email account. I mean, I started at MailChimp, which is not my favorite place, but I did <laughs> start there. Um, I would say almost right away. So for about six years now too. Um yeah, wow. and my background is in the entertainment business, where I was in um, in promotions for um, some um, large music musicians um, that a lot of people would recognize, uh, and we worked a lot um, on email, and it just felt very um, natural to me. And I know that um, email marketing feels often less exciting, you know, than social media, but the statistics right. were there. So I started a newsletter um, right away. Yeah. Wow. I, I find it fascinating because in, in many ways, we always talk about how the book industry is following the music industry. And here we are, you took all this learning of working with musicians from the music industry. And obviously, it was a great way to connect with fans and engage and get them engaged with things, I'm assuming. And you saw this is something for authors that we should be doing too. Yeah, that's interesting insight that um, I know like when, um, not to date myself, but I started in the music industry when musicians were starting to explore going direct and right. um, self-producing their own music and at the record company in the traditional space where I worked, it was like, oh no, like now what are we going to do? You know, and, uh, and there's, um, you know, that was back in the late, you know, mid to late nineties, late nineties, I guess. Uh, and here we are in the author space where that definitely echoed so many authors with the self-publishing boom and um, not so much the direct, you know, the direct to market stuff, but it is definitely there and definitely, I think, on the cutting edge. And I think email is poised to be um, an amazing partner to anybody that's looking to sell direct as well. There are so many things you can do that you can't do with social media. So, yeah, it's exciting. Wow. Cool. So I know we're going to get into the power. We're going to get into the power of the welcome sequence, which I think is really, really important and, and good to spend a lot of time on that. But I'm going to take it back a step further as, as a 
as a novice and say, well, I, I'm a new author. Why do I, why would I even need a, a, an email? I don't have, I don't have any readers yet. Or, or uh, I don't have time for this. I should just be focusing on my books. Can't I just tweet my, you know, and people will just buy my book because they see me on social media. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great if that was true. Um, <laughs> always, always be writing, right? That's always going to be anybody's first kind of if you have time and you need to write, write. But what I love the most about email is that you control that data and that you own that space. So um, what I mean by that is that when somebody trades you their name and their email for um, it doesn't have to be anything or something like for the lead magnet, um, you've now got their their name and their email and you can control that relationship um, where with social media, you're at the mercy of those that run the social media spaces. Um, and there have been quite a few instances over the last 18 to 24 months when a lot of people experienced that control slipping away from them and right. where you can't guarantee that when you put something up, um, on social media, anybody's going to see it, you know, less than 1% are guaranteed to see it, where with email marketing the stats are infinitely better, where, at, you know, the average, I, I get asked a lot, like, well, what's the average open rate and click rate I should be aiming for and setting open rates, um, open rate strategies aside, because those are a whole topic in and of themselves. I mean, industry averages are anywhere between 18 and 22%. Um, our average open rates, uh, and even though open rates are very unreliable as a metric um, that anybody wants to use, but still they're exciting and fun and they're bigger numbers than the click rates. Um, imagine, you know, even if you had a list of 100 people, it's at least 20, you know, 20 people that are going to see it that, you know, you can say on average 20 people are going to see this for every 100. Whereas in a social media account, if you had, had 100 followers, you might be lucky to get one person to see it. So email marketing just offers you um, a, a lot of control over the journey that your readers are taking um, from the very beginning of your journey. And that's a big, a big question I get often is like, like you said, like, why should I even worry about it? Um, I only have like 10 people that I know that might, you know, um, you know, might sign up for my list. And I'm like, that's the perfect place to start because not everybody, actually nobody starts with lists that are huge. And if they are, then there's probably going to be a lot of people on that list that they need to qualify in order to sell books to. So if you have a small list of like 10, 20 people, 100 people, 500 people, and there's so much that you can get that list to do for you in order to test your work, test your theories, um, introduce what you're doing and really kind of on a small scale, figure out where you want your writing business to go and actually get that feedback and that response where um, cause newsletters get opened and they get clicked. Uh, and um, it's worth your time to kind of start and start small and see where it takes you. Well, speaking of starting, why don't we get started on the welcome sequence, the sort of the process and, and what you recommend that people check out? Sure. So in the welcome sequence, um, one of the first questions I get asked when people are building one is how many emails should I build? Um, and I have a bit of a graphic here I can I can show you. And uh, there seems to be a lot of emails on here. But if you look at phase two, which is the bulk and the body of, of the email, you'll see that there are emails one through four. I'm here to tell you that if you only get to email one, you are doing just fine. But ideally, you would want to get four emails that kind of story tell your business, your brand, your books. And that's kind of where you start. And and a template like this is a less intimidating, less overwhelming place to start as opposed to opening up an email service provider and trying to figure out how to even build a welcome sequence in there. I like to build it on paper first, you know, and uh, and I'll typically start with that phase two space. And for most people, you can forget about phase three and four until you're ready to get there. But that phase two piece is like, okay, so I'm going to write four emails. And then the first one, I want to introduce myself and deliver a lead magnet if I have one. And then the second email, I want to deepen that relationship. And, and the third one, I want to try to sell a little bit more. And in the fourth one, 
I'm going to have some fun. And that's kind of the, the system that I take. And the reason I, I say four emails is a great place to be, whether you have one book or 40 books or 400 books to sell is that there's this kind of um, almost like when you're writing your book and you're plotting, if you're a plotter, you know, there are the acts that we typically go through. The, the sequence has the same phases, uh, okay. but people, readers are, I think the, st the stat is like 42% more likely to buy from you inside of a welcome sequence than inside of a, a, a straight up email that you're sending. Really? Yes. So you might as well try to sell them something. Wow. in a very soft and nurturing way, uh, particularly uh, in the first three emails. And email four is where you have to do a little bit more work to kind of pique their interest. And, and I like to use that, that email to really qualify people, but that's the other reason. So you can sell to them much more easily, but you can also reduce the amount of people that unsubscribe or mark you as spam with a really well thought out planned nurture um, sequence, which is that phase two piece before you just kind of blast some emails out there. You're really wow. kind of introducing them to you slowly, letting them see what your voice is, just connecting with them. And then they're less likely to unsubscribe as opposed to, let's say they join your newsletter and you have no welcome sequence. And a few days later, you shuttle off an email saying, here's my, my latest book, you know, buy it. And they're like, who the heck is this? Right. You know, like, but, <laughs> yeah. and like, I don't remember because they get so many every, you know, a lot of readers are really great at signing up for newsletters and they're really great at being on social media and supporting the authors they love. So they're inundated. So you need to have a, a system, which is what your welcome sequence can be to really remind them and nurture them into your brand so that when they do see it, they're like, Oh yeah, I remember that. I really love that. And I'm going to keep opening these emails. So can I go back to something you said? Because this is this is kind of like, wow, never thought of that. <laughs> is you 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 take something like this template and then you don't go on the system or log into the network. You just think about writing maybe on a piece of paper or however offline in some way. Yep. Writing down what those things are going to be from the from very basic. This is who I am, et cetera. And then if there's a lead magnet for anyone listening uh, who doesn't know what a lead magnet is, could you just quickly explain that? Sure. It's a very common question about what should I what should I create as far as a lead magnet go? A lead magnet is just a fancy marketing term for something you offer a reader in exchange for their their name and their email address. And typically, okay. in our space. It's something, it takes the shape of a written piece, a document, whether it's sample chapters, full novellas or full, full books, but it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be that. So don't let yourself get pigeonholed, but it is like the carrot you're dangling in front of somebody like, please join my list. I'll give you something for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, and does it matter? Are there, are there types of magnets that work better or does it, is it all contextual based on the author and their experience? So typically um, um, bonus content works really well for existing readers. So something for, coming from the back matter or the back end of your book works better than something that kind of is something completely different for brand new or cold readers or people that are just discovering you. Um, in another manner, so social media, on your website, at uh, something, it can be almost anything. And I would say, dream up things that match your, your brand. So if you're in a mystery writer, I work with clients who have done a, a mystery, you know, game that they've played or uh, introduction, um, exclusive chapters, or the first three chapters of a book they really want to get them hooked into. I've also done and for travel writers, I've done like my favorite travel spaces. Um, I've done that one myself and it actually goes really, really well. I write a series that's set in Ireland and I took my own pictures and I wrote this. And, and that was when I first started, that was all I had. I didn't have anything written to offer them. And I offered them a, like an insights into my most romantic places in Ireland that I've been. Um, and I still to this day have that one floating around out there. And I got an email yesterday, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is great. I love it. <laughs> um, but typically if you can get some sort of short story or novella or, or full length book in there, it is the one that converts the fastest and the easiest. Okay. 
Thank you for letting me take that little bit of a tangent or sidetrack. <laughs> yeah, anytime, of course. So, so we're, we're focused on that. That you called it the nurturing uh, yeah. phase. The nurturing phase. So you really. So people in in sales, people buy from people they know, like and trust. And the trust piece is what we're we're working on inside of the welcome sequence. Right. So that anytime, um, and it's twofold. It's not just. So the first side of it is for the reader to trust you because they know you. In my welcome sequence, in the very first email, I have a picture of myself. And not everybody is able to do that or comfortable doing that, but right. that builds that trust even faster so mm -hmm. that whenever my name does appear, they're like, oh, yeah, I mean, I looked into her eyes and I think she's cool. You know, I'm going to I'm going to keep opening these. And so a lot of trust is built in that first email, even though it is the shortest one you're going to write. And so in that first email, just to kind of expand on it, I would put my a picture of myself, a link to the lead magnet that I offered. I would orientate them. So reminding them how they got there, particularly for those that do a lot of newsletter builders, anthologies or partner partnering opportunities where there may be a lot of authors involved and they're like, I don't remember doing this. Hey, remember you were in that fill in the blank anthology or sorry. You read that anthology, you signed up for this newsletter, this is me, you know, and okay. here's your, here's your free book that I promised you. And then I set the tone for what's going to come. Yeah. You know, so I'll be in your inbox over the next seven days, three more times or 10 days, however long you want to put in between. And we're going to get to know each other really well. And that whole thing is written in your voice, you know, so it's just this consistent feel for like. Um, every time they pick up a piece of written content from you that wow. um, and your emails can do that so much faster than a social media post. Yeah. Anyway, so it's all about nurturing them deeper into that relationship of trust so that when you appear in their inbox, they recognize you. But the other trust piece that is new and can be stressful for a lot of people in 2022 is the the email delivery service and the receiving emails trust of you. So right. what you want are these clicks to happen. And then that first email, if you're delivering the lead magnet inside of there, typically it's going to get a lot of clicks, which signals um, um, to your email service provider, whether it's Google or Outlook or Hotmail or whatever it is. Um, so the, the readers on the other end, it's like, hey, this person sending this is legit. Because all these people like her. So, and the reason we know that is they're clicking things in her email. Um, we are going to trust her and deliver her to your inbox as opposed to your spam folder. Uh, so that is the, like the, you know, equally as big a reason to kind of pack email number one in right. with a lot of things, you know, particularly the click and, and making sure that somebody knows why they're there so that they don't unsubscribe automatically. So, so you're saying, uh, I'm, I'm, as, a, as I'm, I was going, wow. Uh, so you're sending these four emails in the space of seven days. So it's not you sign up and a month later, you're going to say, hey, remember me? You're actually yeah. doing it almost immediately? And for two reasons. The first one, again, on the reader side of things, their readers are getting a lot of emails in their inboxes. Right. And... Um, it's not always going to be so much from you. And that's why it's important in the first email to say, hey, you're going to hear a lot from me in the next seven days, but I don't want them to wander, you know, so that I usually do the first email immediately as soon as they sign up, two right. days later, the next email, and then I'll do four days later. So there's my week in a bit, and then I'll give it seven days for the, the last one. Um, so over the over the seven day period, they're going to hear probably three times and then another week and they're going to get a fourth email. But it's important to, to be present in their inboxes so that um, a lot of times I'll open and I'll look at an email. Ooh, I want to look at that. And then I don't do it right away. And then it goes da, 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 down. So if I'm sending another email, oh, oh yeah, I wanted to look at that. You're oh, just yeah. kind of trying to always stay there at the top okay. of their inbox. The other big reason is, again, that delivery algorithm that you want to be accessing. So when you're brand new to somebody, their email service provider, let's say it's Google, is like, who the heck is this, right? You know, let's look at the data. And the more data you give it, the more likely your emails are going to be deliverable. 
as opposed to if you send one email and then a month later send the second email, it's like, well, that's not enough data. You know, like uh, if you're going to give them some good data right away, then that second email they get is already got, or sorry, that that first email you send in their regular newsletter delivery sequence, where however often you're going to do that, has a ton of data behind it. And then it's much more deliverable. Can I go back just quickly? So we're talking about the the nurture. I love that. The nurturing, the four emails within a seven day period. But has there been a double opt in already or what's the what, what happened just before that? Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of the double opt in. I know that's like um, it's controversial. It's a hot take, but there are reasons why. And it's not just because. Um, I think they're the best thing, but they're because they're annoying and who loves them, right? Nobody, but <laughs> they serve a purpose. Uh, okay. And I, every email service provider out there gives you the opportunity to customize your double opt-in. So you get a standardized template right. um, and most people just kind of flip a switch. Yes. Double opt-in, please. Particularly like I'm here in Canada where that kind of ticks all of the Canadian anti-spam legislation boxes easier than right. me setting up a landing page that has permissions and, and it's it's less likely to get used in the right way. So I'll enact a double opt-in. Same for the European rules and the GDPR. But if you customize it with your voice and, and you kind of think of it as the beginning of a welcome sequence, it's not actually going to harm, harm you. It's going to do a couple of things. A, it's going to be the beginning of your welcome sequence. So it's for me, mine is um, the first email they get in the double opt-in, you know, is like, oh, hey, you really like me. I'm Canadian. Welcome to my Canadian double opt-in. I love <laughs> Justin Bieber, Timbits, and maple syrup. What if, You know, um, I also love double opt-ins. You know, here's what a double opt-in even is. And so it's- a You order a double opt-in at Tim Hortons, don't you, every time? Yes, a double, double, exactly. <laughs> so the, I write, you know, I try to have like a light rom-com voice that matches that's what my um, my books right. have as well you know and it's branded with my logo so that they're going to see the same thing over and over and over again it's not a whole lot but it's like here's what you need to do in order to get that lead magnet and i'll say whatever it is for me it's a book called a vow you know i know you i know you want to get to reading a vow you just got to click this button and so instead of a link i make it a button you know so that I don't want people to get stuck in that process. And then when they do successfully click that button, they get an automatic thank you. It's like, you do really like me. And here's a picture of me, you know, and I'm like, you know, and now you get to read the book. Congratulations. You made it through the double opt-in. And that's my double opt-in. And it's fun. Um, if, you know, I have some thriller writers that I've worked with and theirs are like, creepy and scary you know and it's but it's just all if you brand it into the voice it's not right. such a bad thing but on the opposite side it um it does a couple of things technically for you the author who's sending it one if people are willing to move through that double opt-in they are highly likely to not mark you as spam or unsubscribe from your emails because they've they've made this extra effort to get there and i often say think about how you as a user of email, as a receiver of email, if I double opt in something, I'm usually spending the time getting that actual welcome email so that I can get whatever it is I was promised. And I want to spend time getting there because it was a it was a pain in the butt, you know, getting to that place. <laughs> but the other thing is those are a legit emails. And again, they are highly clickable because you have to click in order to move through. And right. those send that deliverability signal. Again, they started out really early. And then the third major bonus is you've covered yourself on any sort of legal law with a double opt-in. They're not mandatory, but they do cover all of the things you need to worry about right. um, without you thinking, did I do that right? You did. Okay. And so it's just less to worry about. Wow, we haven't even gotten gotten through the first two, and I've already made a ton of notes. <laughs> like, okay, I have to go fix this. I have to go adjust that. This is fantastic. I just have to pause to say that. Okay, so we've got the double opt-in, and then we have the nurturing sequence. Yes. I guess, is there anything else about the nurturing sequence, or, or, or what's next? I have a new addition to my nurture sequence that I put in right around when last summer Apple 
enacted their new privacy laws um, right. or rules, I guess they're not laws, privacy updates where um, Apple users who are receiving email on a mobile device can opt out. Uh, and there was a lot of kind of strategy thinking, how do I, how do I kind of combat that? Um, how do I shift to a click? How do I strategize things? But also how do I serve the, the reader that I'm serving in a better way so that they stick around and they want to get my emails and they're not like, ew, yeah, I'm turning that privacy thing on, that shield on, no way. So right. I threw in, in the second email, a survey. And for me, that's just two clicks. It depends on what email service provider you use. It looks different, but it's like, are do you want to receive all of the, the news I have? Or would you like to only know about new releases and promotional offers that I have for myself and my, my fellow authors? And so it's the beginning of using your welcome sequence to create a custom experience for the people that are coming in, which again means less people unsubscribing, less people marking you as spam. And what happens there is if somebody says, yes, give it all to me, I have it set up so that it automatically adds them to the group that wants all the things. If they say, I only want this, um, new releases and promos, they go in that and they are excluded from all of the outside of the welcome sequence. All of the regular newsletters I have that don't involve any sort of release or promo. And you have to stay true to that, that request from them. But what it does is it's, again, that trust piece. They're like, oh, yeah, I asked for that. And that is what is being delivered to me. Okay. Um, and, and because they are more likely to click, they're clicking, A, eh? and they're more likely to click, you can get a better read on who's coming in and what they want from your newsletter. So I have that in email number two. So is that, so can I just confirm, it's not new releases, promotions, and everything. It's new releases and promotions and everything. It's just two choices. I give them two choices. Okay. It's the two that I'm most comfortable with. If I right. give them more um, segmentation, they'll never get any, you know, I release slowly. And so I'm like, I need people to like, I need someone <laughs> to give them, right? You know, I can't I just right. go them. Um, so yeah, I'll, I want to, I have promotions that come up and then I have partner authors that I promote with. So yeah, I just give them the two choices. Also statistically in sales, if you give them more than two or three choices, they tend to choose the one you wish they never did or not choose anything at all. So <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I just keep okay. it simple. It also looks a lot cleaner when there's just two options for them. And it's not. And, all and it's also not stressful, right? You re re yeah. removed it. It's like nice and easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's it. That's the nurture sequence. It's like delivering what you promised and setting the, the tone and the stage. The second one, I give them a little taste of something to buy and a little more about me. Okay. And then the third email, I'm selling to them. And I'll come back to that email in one second. And then the fourth email... I'm giving them any social media channels I have. So giving them um, more experience. What I don't want is them to like go off to my social media channels early in that sequence and never come back again. I'm going right. to save that to the end. And then I'm going to sell them a little um, something as well. But if you don't have anything to sell them, my big, my biggest marketing piece of advice I can tell you is never assume that people don't want to know anything about you, whether it's your created pen name or your actual you, you can stretch out for emails with pre-orders, with things you love reading. What, what are you reading right now? What are you, you know, how do you, what top 10 questions you get as an author? You know, there's just so much and thinking about the, the strategy behind the sequence and not so much the selling of the books. And it's that when you do have something to sell them, they have been primed to open every email that you have because they've enjoyed the experience. They trust you and the algorithm trusts you. So abandoning it because you don't have a big backlist isn't going to work for you. You can also ask them questions. Like in my genre, you know, there are, um, I often ask tropes when I'm out of things to sell, like, do you like enemies to lovers or friends to lovers? And then I have a little thing in the back end that's recording what they say. And then when I have an enemies to lovers books book coming out, I'm sending it to that little segment first and get that all, all out of that welcome sequence. That makes a lot of sense, of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. Or even if there's a promo, uh, a friend of yours has a book that is enemies to lovers and yeah. it's on sale, that's perfect for them. They'll probably, hey, you probably might want to know about this. Yeah. 
I've done that tons of times. Like I said, I only release once or twice a year. So I've got to fill the space with, I'm like, Hey, you, I know you love, Hey, and I'll personalize it. Hey, Holly, I know you love enemies to lovers. I just read this book. It's amazing. You got to pick it up. And that goes out only to the people that have ever clicked the enemies to lovers button. And it's again, customizing that experience. They're like, Oh my God, she's talking right to me, you know, and (laughs) it holds that trust piece. But in the back end, you're building this business plan. Wow. Nobody clicked friends to lovers. I have, I am not going to write a friends to lovers book. I really (laughs) should go over here and write an enemies to lovers book. Right. You know, or um, uh, yeah. So it's giving you data and research and then you can use it. So if you don't have anything to sell, sell, you can use the sequence to get data. So you just, you just made me think about something as well. If an author were traditionally published, and, and I was thinking about this because you worked for musicians, and I'm positive that some of them were, or many of them were with big labels, yeah, right? But they still had their own welcome sequence, even though they weren't self-publishing or, or indie publishing their music. So if I'm a traditionally published author, I can still use this to engage with my fans. And potentially, when I want to go pitch a book to my publisher of the next book, I may be able to use some feedback and say, well, I did a survey of my readers, and they really want a book like this. <laughs> I mean, because oh, yeah. that's part of the pitch too, right, is is showing that there's demand. Definitely. Um I use data ma- data driven decisions all the time in my business and for traditional authors they're not necessarily using the the nurturing and the welcome sequence to kind of sell more of their books although a couple of things have happened with a lot of authors I've worked with they're like hey I mean I think I might go hybrid there's a real interest in this right you know mm-hmm. or um, but also yeah go back to their agent and say I've got this book this is what's trending in my list and and your list has power because you can also export that data and say, here, I'll prove it to you. You know, it's like, look at 82% of the people on my list. I have a list of like 5,000 people said they want this kind of a book for me uh, and I'm going to write it next. Can you go shop that around, you know, and see what happens for sure. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Oh, I love that. Sorry. I I just, that, that occurred to me as as you were talking like, Oh my God, that's right. (laughs) This isn't just limited to indie authors. No, not at all. Not at all. And you can do, you know, if you are a trad author and you are doing any signings or you're showing up to events, it's really great to have a list that you've nurtured to kind of come along on the journey with you, uh, whether you're directly selling anything to them or not, which you most often aren't, but you have other things to talk about. And I often think like, you're right in the musician's world or in, in the entertainment world in general, they're not so much in control of of the transaction, but they're very much in control of the brand and what happens to it and, you know, what's coming out and how can they, they as authors support their brand as well as the team that's behind them. Cool. Awesome. So sorry, I sidetracked you again. From the, from I don't the know, it's all good. But, <laughs> well, the, the next kind of common question I get is, well, what do I do with all the people that have been through here? And they've done nothing, you know, like I want to, um, you know, I want to get all these freebie seekers, do something with them. What should I do? And they're clicking nothing. They're opening nothing. I don't know what to do. And that's like email, the final email in the sequence. And you send it only to those. And and you can tell your email service provider, send this email specifically to only the people that have done nothing um, prior to this. Right. And so it will sort that for you. A, there's another segment. Yeah. So it's like, all right, I've got column A, Keeners. I've got column B, not so much. Um, <laughs> and um, I need to qualify them before I decide then what to do with them. So I'm going to send them my very last email. And it's not an email that's selling anything, but its only goal is to get opened and clicked. So it has to have a super crazy subject line that you know is is going to be very compelling, you know, and there are a lot of those out there that you can test and figure out. And I have mine as just a a real simple triggering question that I know everybody has an opinion on. And and so, and that's- Is it about pineapple and pizza? Is that that the one? Similar, 
<laughs> but in, the, in in my world, it's I have two different questions I oscillate between. One is, do you like man buns? Yes or no? And I wrote a book with a hero that had a man bun, and I got so much negative pushback. Um, but coming from the music world, that's a lot of what I you know kind of hung out with. And I was like, oh, that was normal. Ew, gross. This is awful. But it was the best thing ever because I had so many people emailing me back saying, I hate man buns. I'm like, okay, well he's gonna get. It. <laughs> He's now going to get a haircut in the middle of the book, right? But right. Um, <laughs> but it's triggering, right? Like, ew, no, ew. And then you get the odd yes. And then I have it set up to say, those that clicked yes, I'm like, I'm going to deliver them this one book I wrote that has a man bun in it, a man bun <laughs> hero. And um, it's it's like 2% of the, all the people that I, that have ever read anything that enjoy that. But still, I give them a little like, hey, thanks. Um, I do that one. And then um, the other one that I do that I get a ton of feedback in is, are you into alpha heroes or beta heroes? You know, and, and all you got to do is click and tell me. Wow. And then once that's delivered, I'm not selling them anything. So they, they feel, yeah, I'll tell you, you know, and, and there's a picture of me going, you know, <laughs> smiling heavily. And I've got a thumbs up actually in that one. And, and that's it. And then I sort at the end of the, of the sequence I tell and I say I sort but I really don't do any of these things the the um the email service provider is doing all of it for me okay tell me everybody that made it from top to bottom give them a little tag tell right. me everybody that made it from top to bottom and didn't do anything they get their own tag tell me everybody that made it from top to bottom and engaged and they get a third tag so those are the three kind of things I'm looking for and then what I do from there is kind of like 2.0 but what I I do want the big thing I would say is 1.0 everybody should do is make sure you tag people on the way out, no matter what they did, so that you can put that in what's called a condition on the way in, which says if they've been here before, don't give them the sequence all over again. And then that also helps you reduce those unsubscribes because there's nothing worse than they're like, I've had all these emails. Oh my gosh. Um, they're coming at me. And you can also with that tag, exclude people that are currently in the welcome sequence from your regular newsletters so that they're not getting all of these welcome sequence emails and all of the regular things, which makes them angry and they're more likely to unsubscribe. Yeah, because the the the, the regular newsletters after I've already shook your hand and introduced myself and then you just jumping right into this relationship. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so that one tag on the way out is really important. And then you set what's called a condition on the way in to make sure you filter out anybody who's received this before. It's really important for people that have a big backlist and offer bonus content at the end of that, you know, because tend to have most of the readers say, yeah, give me the bonus content. I, right. and, and they're kind of re-entering their name and to make sure that you filter them out you deliver the bonus content and then that condition happens right after. Oh, they've been here before. Out they go. Okay. Wow. This is, uh, this is fantastic. I, you, you'd mentioned briefly, you're talking about the mail service provider offers this thing and they do that automatically. Are you okay with recommending mail service providers that you recommend or would use? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I use in my business, a mix of MailerLite, ConvertKit and Flowdesk. I use a mix for a bunch of different reasons, but if you're looking for one to use and it's, it's a hot take again right now is MailerLite is my, is my preferred email service provider. But of course, tomorrow they're like flipping the switch on a whole new system, which We'll have to wait and see what that looks like. They, the reasons I love MailerLite are, A, they're ranked highly deliverable, which means when you hit send, that email is going to end up somewhere, uh, most likely not in a spam folder. There are right. reasons why it might. B, they have great customer service. C, they have a really good, robust free plan. So you can try them out and get access to all of the things where people say, well, MailChimp has that too. MailChimp has a free plan under 2,000 subscribers, but it doesn't include anything other than one email. Um, and it doesn't include customer service. And it doesn't include, the list goes on and on. They're not my favorite email service provider for a lot of technical reasons. They are not highly deliverable because they do have, they do offer the access to an what's called an unverified email. So a, you can use a Gmail address to send emails from them. 
And typically those get hacked more often than not, or they're sent as spam. So they are marked as spam more often when you're using it to send. They also have just been bought out by an accounting firm. And um, there's a lot of angst about what will, what will they look like, you know, in, in the future. Uh, they're just not my favorite. The biggest thing is that typically when people are starting with an email service provider, they have a lot of questions. And there's a lot of things to learn. They're not easy to learn from. Uh, and that's what I do like about MailerLite is that they have a great service department, whether you have the live chat feature or in the free version, it's an email ask. I like Flowdesk for those that have big lists because it is a flat rate and you can um, work a big list over there. However, there are some hiccups that they have with authors and and bringing in um, lists from BookFunnel or Prolific Works or anthologies. And so it's just as long as you are aware of that beforehand, they are a great space to kind of hang out if your list is growing um, and really affordable. And I love ConvertKit the most because it does all those things I've been talking about those segmentations, those automations, if you are into that, into setting up something that is like growing your business in the back end with recognizing clicks and moving them in different directions, it can do that better than almost any other service provider. However, you're going to pay for it. Wow. That, wow. Thank you. <laughs> that is That is a great breakdown of why you're using certain systems. We're getting close to the end. We just have a few minutes left before wrapping up. Are there any sort of last minute things that you think authors really need to know about welcome segments, just their author email in general? The, in 2022, it's all about, um, you'll hear the word deliverability bantered about a lot. It is because Google has changed um, their user experience. And, and I mean, I won't, go on and on with boring information about it, but they are going to change again. They have some more changes planned um, for the rest of 2022. Apple Mail has done uh, the, the privacy update that they have. Um, it's harder to compete with other authors and other brands in inboxes. So you want to make sure that the effort that you're putting out has the best chance of landing, which is what deliverability is on the other end. So it's really important to understand the technical reasons behind why things, why say Gmail decides to put your email in the inbox, in the promotions tab, or in the spam folder. And on my website, I have a free deliverability checklist. You can go there and download it and check it out if you want to kind of have a little bit of a walkthrough of what you need to do, but it's all about the data. And so emailing once in a while isn't going to work as well anymore because you're not a trusted source, you know, to the algorithm that's unfortunately right. algorithms are everywhere. Right. And they, and it's no different in an inbox. And the, what they really want is to give their user the experience that they're looking for. And so your emails, no matter if they're in a welcome sequence or if they're in a regular send need to understand what's happening and, and why their emails need to be a certain way. And so the biggest thing I can leave you with, outside of the welcome sequence is even the emails inside of the welcome sequence need to have a heavier text component than an, a link and, and a visual or so an image component than ever before because I mean it, it's annoying right it's easy it doesn't look yeah. as pretty and all that but what gmail would think I'll use them as another example is oh this looks most like somebody who's written a friend, right? So the more text they're like, oh, this is, this looks like more of a friendly nature. There is less, there are less buttons, images, links, because spammers typically only have, you know, a little line of text and a link that goes somewhere, right? You know, right. piles of images. Um, and there are ways to get emails that are image heavy delivered into inboxes. Um, and the biggest thing is to get people to click them, but you have to get delivered first. So Think of these ratios when you're building your welcome sequence emails. Think of the strategy behind why you want to focus on the click as opposed to the open. Forget about the open rate because it's really unreliable as a metric. And then just change the change your mindset about about what you want to happen and what you know what you think should happen, you know, as to technically I know I need a click here, so I'm going to make sure my click is attractive. It's not, I don't have, and in an author space, we have a tendency to put 
all of the links inside of all of our emails, yeah. you know, and it, that's just a big red flag. Like, oh, oh we're selling something, right? I'm going to shuttle that, that thing off into the promo or the spam folder. So in your welcome sequence, build emails that are efficient with lots of text and a, in as close as you can get to a single call to action. I know that makes people nervous, but you know, I'll have three I'm wide. So it's, you know, I'll, I'll do those that I've tested that I know work for me. Amazon, Apple goes between Google, Google and Kobo, you know, on the other end. Right. And if they need to find me in other places, typically the chances are good that they're going to, but I try not to muddy the waters with a lot of different links, which flag wow. you as spam. So when you're writing the welcome sequence, even just having one is better than having none and having um, emails that ha are text heavy and storytell are much more deliverable. Wow. Uh, so one other thing I want to ask then, because I think one of the things that I've run into that's been a challenge is doing a monthly newsletter. I go, okay, I've got all these things to share because I'm going to be at this event and doing this talk and I'm going to be signing my book and I got this book release and I got a sale coming up and, oh, what about the things I just finished? And then all of a sudden it's this phone book of nothing but links and images. Yeah. And I probably put people to sleep in the first three seconds. Do you recommend, is there a pattern that works relatively well in terms of regular emails? Is it monthly? Is it twice a month? Is it every two weeks? Is it every 15 minutes? I'm just kidding. But like, what, what, what seems to work well? So technically, the accepted standard is weekly. That makes people, okay. gives people hives often. <laughs> However, there are a lot of authors out there that are killing it weekly. I like to batch emails once a month. I'll write four emails. Um, for me, I'm bi-weekly now because I don't have anything to release. But what I really want is to amp up my deliverability. So I'm going to access what I know the algorithm is looking for, which is weekly emails. But they're short. So think of your four emails. If you broke that one long email out into four sections, so you've got one promotional email. Ooh, guess what? That one's going to that segment of people that asked for promotional emails. Um, on its own. And then I'm going to send it again, three days later to the all the people you've just sent two emails in one week, right? So now you're double what you've, you've had your output at. And then right. the people that ask for everything are going to get an email at the top of every month with what's happening with me, you know, and it's but it's shorter, because the, the, the promotion piece is coming at them two weeks later. And it's more work, but it makes you more deliverable. And if you think about your own reading habits of emails, do you typically read every author's email from top to bottom? No. Okay. Most people read what's at the top. So A, if you have something that you need to sell, you better put it at the top, but right. in a nice, kind, gentle, nurturing way, right? With some storytelling around it. Right. Um, don't just go right in like, buy this book. It, you know, I like to always like kind of set the, set the tone for that, but make sure that that button or that ask is in the top. It's like above the scroll if possible, if not just one scroll down and shorten it. There's no easy answer, whether yeah. you're doing social media, newsletter marketing, whatever it is, it's that frequency and consistency is needed. And that's why I like to focus on newsletters. I don't do a ton of social media because it's enough work just to get this email <laughs> marketing to, you know, get right. out the door all the time, but it does convert into dollars way faster than social media. So. Wow. So for anyone who's listening to this or watching this and feels, oh my God, this is so much, I'm so overwhelmed. Now you mentioned you had resources on your website. Do you offer services to help authors? Do you coach them? Do you, do you train them? Are there training things they can do? Are there like, what, what's, how can you help authors who are, are just still feeling, oh no, okay, thanks for the info, but I still, I'm scared. What do I do next? Yeah, that's normal. Especially when I start talking about newsletters, like, <laughs> um, uh, yes and no. I used to write people's emails for them. Mm -hmm. I used to create welcome sequences for them, but I'm a big believer, particularly in our space, that my voice can get close to yours, but it's not going to be yours. And but I do have one-on-one -on -one consults available if anybody wants to. Like, I want you to kind of walk me through what I need to do. Let's look, let's share screens and look at my, my newsletter system and you can help me. But more often you're welcome to come to my website. I have tons of free, I have a free mini course on email marketing strategy, you know, free course on how to get started with MailerLite, how to get started with MailChimp, how to get, 
don't think I have one on Flowdesk, but I have a course on Flowdesk, but there's lots of um, blog posts and lots of free resources there. And that deliverability checklist, you can kind of download. And what's, the, what's the URL for your website for anyone listening? It's hollydarlinghq.com. Awesome. And so people can go there to, to get access to all kinds of free resources, or if they wanted to book you, because they don't know, I think I need an hour with Holly yeah. <laughs> to, to talk through my specifics. They can do that. And then I have some paid like in depth. So I have a mailer light course. I have a flow desk course. Um, and then I have a general email strategy course. And then I have a little mini course on welcome sequence in a weekend. So, you know, it's like six videos and it walks you through every phase. So you don't have to, you know, really think too hard. And you have my samples there that you can use as inspiration. It's not genre specific. So it's, it's whatever. And yeah, I did bring a code for all your your listeners as well too so. oh there's a code for all my listeners mm -hmm. yeah it's mark this? 20 and you can get 20 percent off oh. anything that is paid um any of the paid courses that i have too hang on I, I i forgot to add that as a as a banner so i'll just pop that up here uh, mark 20 can get you 20 percent off any of the courses yep. at holly darling hq.com that's it Holly, this was so enlightening, and I, I just realized how much homework I have to do now, which may include going and checking out the courses just to refresh, not only re-listening uh, back to this, but, and I think the comment might come in, oh, just uh, just a comment from Takiri, who says, uh, great interview, I thank you so you. much. <laughs> thank you for that comment, and uh, yeah, Holly, thanks again. This has been such a, such a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you hanging out. I appreciate the live uh, folks who are watching this live. And of course, I appreciate all listeners to the podcast. If you want to check out other content at uh, starkreflections.ca, I release at least one episode per week and I'm at episode 241. I'm not sure where I'm where this is going to be in the queue, but it's going to be shortly after 241. And Holly, again, thank you so much for uh, that. Again, Nadine just popped uh, and said that it's useful, so useful information with a big smiley face as well. <laughs> Alrighty, so that concludes it. Um, again, you can check out Holly over at uh, hollydarlinghq.com or if you're interested in, in some of her uh, rom-com, you've got hollymortimer.com to check out. And thank you guys so much for listening. And Holly, you have a wonderful night too. Thanks, Mark, for having me. So much for me to learn. So, so many amazing things. Listening back to this was more eye-opening than when I was doing it live. Because when I was doing it live, I'm, I'm interviewing everyone. I'm listening back to it. I'm taking even more notes. So this was fantastic. A couple takeaways, a couple reflections are... First thing is the idea of too many calls to action. And, and, and that's kind of like having too many choices. And, and I know I have made that mistake repeatedly. Like too many too many links because I'm like, well, what if they don't like this? And and this may be a side effect of the fact that I have different kinds of readers. So just on just on the Mark Leslie side, when I don't even get into the guy who's the business of writing and publishing, who for the most part, um, my author newsletter is not meant for people about the business of writing and publishing at all, although my personality is still part of it. But even just in, in the fiction, I write True ghost stories. That's a, that's a kind of uh, book that I write. I write horror. I write thrillers. Uh, in particular, the series, the Canadian Werewolf series, which is uh, comedic thrillers, and a lot of different short stories and stuff like that. But but even there, even though there's a, there's a decent crossover between the the different genres, it's difficult for me because uh, there may be a ghosty thing that I'm doing. There may be something related to the Canadian Werewolf series that people who are there for the ghosts don't care about. And so I need to really spend some time thinking about how to deal with that. Maybe I book a consultation with Holly and maybe she walks me through it. But I am going to start by taking the free course that she offers. And don't forget, if you want to use any of her paid courses, you can use the code MARK20 to get 20% off. But Coming back to the too many calls to action, I think that's an issue uh, that I've made, and I'm going to I'm gonna have to address it. But sometimes too many choices, she talks about when you're doing a survey, just just two is good. And so I was thinking about, this is where books2read.com, where making a universal book link could come in really, really handy. 
So instead of having, you know, Amazon and Apple and Google Play and Kobo and Nook, and, and again, you know, with most of those places except Nook, you have like eight or nine different Amazon stores. You have 30 different Kobo places or uh, Google Play or Apple places as well. That's way too many links. But a universal book link solves that because it will take them to the geo-targeted version of Apple or Amazon or Kobo or Google Play, etc. And so that's a single link that can actually be beneficial. The other thing I just really want to go back in, I, I do have to go back into my uh, sequence and, and the double opt-in. I love the idea of personalizing the double opt-in and making it part of my brand. I just love that. So I'm really eager to, to go back in and dig into that. And then, of course, similar to the too many calls to action is, and, and we talked about this, but I'm just sort of reflecting on it again, is doing my monthly newsletter and trying to jam everything in there to try and please everyone, not necessarily the best thing to do. So I'm going to look at emailing my list, actually, just to warn them, because when they signed up, I said you would get no more than 12 to 15 a year. And, and I don't want to change what I promised them, but I do want to give them an opportunity to back out if they don't like it. So looking at a sequence that I can set up, mapping it out on paper, as Holly says, not digitally, and then going in, and sending a note to people saying, hey, I know when you signed up, I promised you this, but I'm, I'm revising things, I'm going to send shorter things, and I'm going to send them more regularly. And I'm looking at seeing if I can do a every two-week cycle as opposed to a monthly cycle, which means you're going to get between 24 and 30 emails a, um, a year. Uh, or whatever, I have to figure that out. Um, 52 divided by, I can't, I, I can't do math in my head, 26. <laughs> so you can get between 24 and 30 uh, emails a year from me. And and that gives a, people a chance to say, no, I'm not, I'm not into it. But maybe I can also do a survey with that and say, well, what, what are you interested in? And then I can target the people. So if, if in one week, all I'm talking about is my ghost story stuff, I, uh, it, you can see I'm working this out live as I'm not live, but as I'm recording this, <laughs> but, um, but maybe this is good for you to see. It's good for you to see how I'm trying to figure this out. But yeah, the idea is maybe, uh, the people who want the ghost story books, uh, on week one, I'm going to send the ghost story thing. And on, um, the week three, cause it's every two weeks, for example, it's going to be an update on the Canadian werewolf books. And maybe that's for, um, people who identify as fans with a survey or maybe there's a, a generic one that is just a sales and promos that are that are going on so that's one way i can split things down and, and the newsletter doesn't have to be so bloody stressful like this is my only letter and i'm writing in it it's going to take weeks to get this letter I, I remember i used to i used to write handwrite to my best friend steve when when he was in college and i was still in high school we used to write these letters, like handwritten letters, and they would be pages and pages because we're trying to catch the dude up on what we've been up to. <laughs> and, I, and I tried to model my newsletter after that. Hey, okay, it's like I'm writing to Steve. And I did take that specific approach. I thought, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm writing to Steve. I'm telling him what I'm up to. And that's who this is for. Steve never reads my author newsletter, particularly because he's scared of werewolves and doesn't like them. So um, he, he's not my, he's my best friend, but he's nowhere near my target audience for my books. But I think about what if I was writing a letter to him, but then I'm thinking, no, I don't need to go back to the late eighties and, and think about the, the six page handwritten letter I sent to him. I can send something one week and, and, and he'd get it right away or the reader would get it right away. Anyways, that's just me mumbling through working out some of the things I think I'm going to do based on what I learned from Holly. How about you, dear listener? Do you have any reflections on what you've learned or what you might try to implement? Don't forget, you can always go and check out her free courses. You can always check out uh, Holly for consultation as well. And that's over at hollydarlinghq.com. But that is it for this reflection. That is it for episode 243. Thank you, dear listener, so much for listening. If you like the podcast, do please feel free to share it with someone that you think would find value in it. You can also leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. So until next week, or not quite next week, because the next episode's coming before next week. So until the next episode, which should only be days away, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The 
music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Thank you.